To God be the glory. What a beautiful day it is, family, you body of believers, wonderful people. It is so great to be here. God is just so amazingly awesome, and it is just so fantastic to share this message with you today. I thank you for being a partner with us at Julie Blow Ministries and part of our, we may say, social media community. So if you haven't already participated with us, and you know the drill with the like, the subscribe, and all of those other things, but really my most important concern is that you come to know Jesus. So if you've done that, then hit the little partner with us button. They might call it subscribe, but I call it partner because that's just more where, where we are in align with. As with all things, I welcome you. And before we start any message, we must pray. So Father, today I thank you for this message. I thank you for this exact message spoken in this exact way, led by your Holy Spirit. I thank you that every word is led by you, filled with love, grace, peace, hope, liberty, humility, and compassion. May we come to receive from you today, walk in love, and demonstrate that to others. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I am convinced that there are two types of obedience. There is obedience out of fear, and there is obedience out of love. It is my firm belief that those that walk in obedience out of fear are bound. Bound in religion, bound by the fear of religion, bound by fear. Therefore, they are obedient. On the opposing side, I believe that there are those that are obedient out of love. And it is love that drives that level of obedience to a way that may have them standing alone at times that most cannot comprehend. Today I'm going to give you seven great men and women of the Bible that have stood alone in obedience, and I believe stood alone in obedience out of love. And so as we begin on this journey, I want to take you to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis has so many fascinating things in it, and it's just, there's so much in Genesis that we could literally camp out here forever. However, we won't. <laughs> but in the book of Genesis chapter 6, I want to take you to the man of Noah. But as we get to the man of Noah, I want to take you in chapter 6 of Genesis to verse 5 and show you something that I believe is, is very telling of the God that we serve. But in 6-5 of Genesis, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now, obedience, just like disobedience, is a choice. Your obedience to God does not happen on accident, similar to forgiveness and walking in love or loving others. Not an accident. We must purpose to be obedient. Okay? Now, fast forward with me, or scroll down, or look down, however you, you have your Bible in front of you. As we move to verse 9, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Sound familiar? God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress, wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. So he gives them the instructions of how to build the ark. And then in verse 18, but I will establish my covenant with you and you and your sons and your wife and, and your sons with you. Now, interesting that we know that a 
uh, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time and before the Lord. Now, he also says in verse 7, I want to take you to verse 7, uh, or chapter 1, or chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. In order to be considered righteous in your generation would mean that you are most likely going against the grain because you would be obedient to God more so than compromising to the lack of standard morals in today's society. So Noah stood. I find Noah quite fascinating in a way that I wonder what, like, what do the neighbors think? Here he is building this ark, and you might say, well, they, he didn't live in a covenant control community. But when, when you really think about Noah and what Noah was doing in that time and what he was really building, it wasn't a small feat. It wasn't something that he just decided and say, let me just build a little matchbox, matchbox ark. He, he didn't do that. And those of you that may not know matchbox, matchbox cars are little, little tiny cars that are about this, this big that go in little race, racetracks for children. Noah did not do that. He, he built a man-sized ark, we may say, supersized it. He, he followed the instructions of God. He stood alone in his obedience, and God considered him righteous. You may be faced with doing something that God tells you to do that no one else is doing, that everyone else might, might scoff at. However, you must stand in that obedience because what will come through your obedience may be for future generations. Sometimes we, we don't really realize how much our obedience matters, but God is concerned about your obedience more so than anything. Many people want God to be concerned about their, their, their woes of, of this world, but God is more concerned about your obedience than how many homes you desire to have. And so when we really look at that obedience, would be demonstrated out of love by Noah. Now turn with me still in Genesis to chapter 19. Now, when we get into chapter 19, there's a story of a man named Lot. I find Lot too very interesting in what it must have been like for him to be obedient in the time that he was. So we start off in chapter 19 of Genesis. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down, bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. Interesting that he, he knew that they were angels. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. How, when's the last time you went to someone's house and they prepared bread for you? <laughs> Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Now, God already knew. We can, go, we can also see in, in Leviticus that God has already given us warning that men shall not lay with men and we shall not cross-dress. And all the things that we're seeing today are really just a slap in the face of God. They called to Lot. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me, let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. And the daughters aren't. But that's, that's a whole other separate thing. Get out of our way, they replied. The fellow, the fellow came here as a foreigner and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness so they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, son-in-laws, daughters, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get 
them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his son-in-laws, his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and his hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them to safety, safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they were brought, as soon as they had been brought out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plains. Flee to the mountains or you'll be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lord, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you've shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains or this disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, there's a town near enough to run to and it's small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. Now, Lot got out because of his obedience. His wife, well, she turned around and came a pillar of salt. What happens in this scenario with most people is this. Never mind that they thought he was joking, right? The sons, the sons-in-laws. But when God gives an order or God gives a command or God expects obedience, that's the end of it. What happens though is, well, I'll be obedient when I understand what you want me to do, but until then, I'm not doing anything because I need to understand, because I don't understand, because I need to operate here instead of here. And what ends up happening is that obedience is lost. Imagine if Noah had spent all that time, instead of just building the ark, trying to understand and then build. He never would have been able to understand. And why would God need to sit down and really have that kind of conversation when God's the one giving the orders? This is what will happen if you go forward not recognizing that your obedience weighs more than your understanding of why. It's very tricky and it's very challenging because in our society, we believe we need to understand before we obey. Well, no, God needs you to obey, period. And that's the trick. It's not about our understanding, it's about our obedience. Through obedience, you will begin to understand. Lot's life was spared because he was obedient, not because he needed to go schedule a meeting with God to talk about why God was telling him to do it. It's irrelevant. God is God. That's the problem. Many of us think that we're God, and we don't understand God, nor do we really revere God as God, and as such, we end up losing and missing out on opportunities, and then we get swept away. Well, if I only would have been obedient. I remember when God told me to do this. Yeah, did you? Obedience to God is what will save your life. The enemy, though, mm, we know what he did to Eve. See, he trickled in. Did God really say that's the trick? Well, let me ponder that. Well, no, this is what God said, period. This is why it's very important when God speaks that you know what he said, not what you interpret in your mind. That's another trap of the enemy. So when God speaks something to you, and I'm, and I'm speaking this is that God will be speaking to you because you will be seeking for him to be speaking to you, you write it down. Never leave it to interpretation. Well, this is what I think God said. That's great. Did God say that? Or is that what you think? Because your mind will mess you all up. You need to know what did God speak, period. It is transcribed. If somebody ever wants to give you a word of prophecy, write it down. Hmm. I have a word from the Lord. Can you write that down, please? Well, this is what I think God is saying. No, what you think God is saying may or may not be what God is saying. Your interpretation is not the word of God. The word of God and what God speaks is the word of God. That's what will trip a lot of people up in being obedient. Lot, imagine if Lot, now, did he, did he ask these questions? Yes, can I go to this place so I don't die? God granted him that, but he was still obedient. He was still obedient and following. There's a lot of things happening right at that exact time. When it's time to be obedient, you better just get to being obedient. <laughs> it's the best way to say it. And the more that you're obedient, the easier it will get. Okay, so when we, when we really look at obedience, it's what's going to save your life. So we have to walk in full obedience. It doesn't matter what the world wants you to believe. Well, you know, it's just not fair. It doesn't matter if it's fair or not. God's obedience is what matters, not fairness.
But what's happened in today's society is we've turned everything into some kind of social justice campaign. God's not interested in social justice. God's interested in the fullness of your obedience to him above all. Because God is the justice campaign. We don't need social justice when we have God's justice. God's justice will prevail. But if we're not obedient, well, why would you expect justice? Where is it going to come from? It won't because God's justice works on your behalf as you work with God. But if you're not obedient and you're living a compromised life, don't expect justice. Why would you expect to live ungodly or why would you live ungodly and expect godly results? It doesn't work like that does not work like that. You want the fullness of God's promises and everything of God while you're shacking up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, unmarried, doing every single thing else that God's word says not to do, and then blaming God that you're not blessed. Well, quite frankly, you don't need to be, you shouldn't deserve to be because you're living in sin and disobedience. We don't like talking about those things because they're not fun. However, obedience will save your life and through obedience many more things will be able to enter into your life now i'll give you an example of someone who lived by this turn with me to the book of kings chapter 22 quite a fascinating prophet now there's lots of prophets in the bible but there's a few things that 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 are interesting that i'll share but chapter 22 first kings for three years, there was no war between Aram and Israel. But then the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So we asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? You know, it's Tuesday, why not? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people is your people, my horses is your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First seek the counsel of the Lord. Uh, yeah, wisdom is found in, in, in counsel, right? We know King Solomon, counsel is found in the Lord. So wise king here. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, about 400, 400 prophets, and asked them, Shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? Go, they answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? Well, there's, wise count. there's wisdom right there. The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. <laughs> His name is Micaiah, son of Imlah. He just, he just never tells me how great I am. Therefore, yeah, I hate him. How often do we hear that? We seek out that which tells us, we're so pretty. Oh, look at you. You're just the best thing ever since Brie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The king should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imla, at once. Okay. So... Out of 400 prophets, there's one, but one. There only needs to be one. Are you the one? So we, we move down here. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing, verse 12. So all the prophets are saying the same thing. Okay, so 399 saying the same thing. The messenger in verse 13 who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, look, the other prophets, without exception, are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. Oh, so you just come on along, get along, just, just, just obey them, and all will be good in the world. Never mind by you doing so, you're setting up the whole army for death. It's a death trap. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. Well, to God be the glory for Prophet Micaiah as well as, like, remember Nathan, uh, Naboth, Nathan, Prophet Nathan, who spoke to, uh, to King David. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth, Iliad, or not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Then he continues forward, right? And... And he says, 
He tells them to be enticing, but let me take you to 23 for a minute because this is something of interest. So they're having this conversation. And, and he tells him, you will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord, go and do it. So he knows that he's got the go-ahead to go and do this. But here's the thing in 23. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. How many of the prophets today have been filled with a deceptive spirit? This is why you can't go and just chase what anybody says, because you really don't know what spirit's been put in their mouth. You really don't know. Sounds good. Doesn't mean it's God. This prophet Micaiah, I just love this brother. I love the brother because he wasn't deterred by the other 399. He did, it, that had no effect. Well, what are they saying? It's, a, it's irrelevant. Well, what are they doing? It's irrelevant. The only thing that matters is what you're doing with God. Well, you know, they're, who cares? Not your business. What they do and what they say is not your business at all. The only thing that is your business is obedience to God. So maybe all of us should have a slogan if we're going to be in slogans and mantras, whatever people have these days, might be, uh, my business is obedience to God. Period. I'm about my father's business, which is based on obedience. I go and do and say only what the father tells me to do and say. This man stood separate and he was hated for it. Oh, I hate him. I hate him because he never prophesies anything good ab about me. Maybe there's a reason. <laughs> maybe there's a reason, but always bad. Well, maybe there's a reason. Lessons can be learned through obedience. This man was a great example of someone who stood alone in obedience in the midst of many. Are you going to be that one or will you be compromised like so many others and then mm, never really get to the fullness of God as a result it's a choice and when we're really looking at today's society uh, it's it's becoming more important now than ever because you're going to really have to make those decisions and stick with them I want you to turn with me to the book of Job chapter 2 I love Job and we know that that God has said in the book of Job, we'll be in, we'll be in chapter 2, but God has said that he was blameless and upright. The fact that God would be speaking about Job in such a way, it's just so humbling. It's so very humbling. What would God say about you? You see, many people today use God to get ahead. They use God and worldly ways and means of scheming for titles to get ahead, to get ahead, to jump, to jump, to build a career, to build a platform. And they use people. And it's very sad in many ways. You see it all over social media. People come into groups and then they get in the group and they just use the group to build their own platform. You don't do that to people, especially, especially ministers of the Word of God. It's their platform. You just go in and bring in all your other buddies. It's like it's like you're invited to a dinner party and, and you bring your, your your boyfriend and his whole family and their extended family and, and then everybody just eats and leaves and doesn't help with the dishes. It's not okay. And Job, Job was known by God. God said that Job was righteous and blameless or blameless and upright. How do you want God to introduce you to others in a book. How would God, what would God say about you? We often don't, we don't really think about that. Oh, well, here's my loud mouth one. <laughs> oh, here's my little work in progress. But, but in all seriousness, how would God, how would, how would God describe you? When we look at Job in chapter two, Job just went through all of these wonderful things. And I say wonderful things because we know what God did in the outcome. In the beginning of any tragedy and trial, it is definitely a tragedy and a trial. It is, it is very damaging what Job, what Job went through. Although, in this, Job recognized something separate from himself. In verse, in, in verse 9, chapter 2, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, 
You are talking like a foolish woman. Good thing he did not even entertain what she said. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And all this Job did not sin in what he said. There will be a time when as you go in forward with your obedience to God, that people are going to entice you to other opportunities. There are people that will, that will probably try to get you to curse God when you're going through something. Well, yeah, you know what, God just, look at God, God just, he hasn't really done a whole lot for you, has he? God is just hasn't really done much in this way or that way for you. You know what, I'd be mad at God too. And, and you know what, when is God ever going to do anything? Boy, you've been praying a long time for that. You think God's ever really going to show up? Oh, you know what, he will, so shut up because I'm not entertaining that. You have to get to the place when you really study Job that Job did not entertain. He took every thought captive. Now, we do know that, yes, he had fear over him, and we were, I, I fear that this day would come upon me. And yes, there was some puffery of pride built, built in there, which you get to in chapter 42. However, he was not deterred by what his closest would say. Within the family unit, those people there have really probably the most impact in your life. They have the most influence. Are you listening to what they are saying? And and if they are choosing to not to not go with God, then you can't. I mean, really, I liken it to this. I have someone, a, a friend of mine. I don't even know if I can call him a friend. Just a person that I know. That that I said, look, I I need to. This was years ago. I said I need to go. It's twelve o'clock prayer in about five minutes. Oh, you sure do pray a lot. Yes, says the person who never prays. And that kind of shut that down. See, when you look at the people that are speaking into your life, it isn't the people that are speaking into your life, it's also what they're speaking. And why would they say these things? And it doesn't matter the, the where she was. It really matters where he was. He was the head of the household. He was not entertained in nonsense. And he really put her in her place, which would be divorce in, in some places today. And, and so I still laugh at, at that in some ways because you could just, <laughs> the claws come out. Oh my God, we put a little arsenic in the soup. Whatever it is, you know, people kind of tend to go crazy. However, an open rebuke is needed at times because what it does is it tells other people, you will not behave like this and this is how I will behave. See, when you let your obedience to Christ be known, oh, people will know. And they will know what boundaries they cannot cross with you. And that is very, 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 very important. Job set the standard. He set the stage. He did not waver in his actions or who he was in the Lord. Your obedience is going to require that. Because there will be the door knocks. There will be the, com the people coming. There, there will be the attacks, whether it's personal, professional. And I can speak to this from... from experience. I've been put on sabbatical at one of the colleges I teach for for 10 months because I, was, I am a Christian. And I stood, yes, before the Dean of Academic Affairs, before the Dean of General Education, before the Dean and HR. Yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I am a follower of Yeshua. But we need to investigate that. Oh, you go right on ahead. You'll find enough evidence. Trust me. Mm-hmm. You have to get to that place. Because if you don't, you'd be like Peter. Or worse, you would be a Judas. And I'll be teaching on Judas here shortly. But obedience would be out of love. So when you say, well, I'm a follower of Christ, are you willing to die for him as he did for you? Or does it just sound nice at parties? Job didn't play games. We cannot be playing games with the Word of God. We cannot be playing games with our relationship with Christ. We cannot be playing games with who we claim that we are. You either need to be all in or get out. And I say that with a level of boldness because there's too many lukewarm Lucys and in, in Luke sitting in, in, in the body of Christ that think it's a game. And it's not a game. You're playing witchcraft and you don't even know it. You're going to have to make a choice because so if you don't stand it for Jesus, then you are compromised. Job was not. Micaiah was not, and he was hated for it. Esther, turn with me to Esther. 
was not. Just one book to the left, chapter two. Interesting, same, same uh, 2.10 as it was with Job. Now, what's interesting is that Esther had an orphan spirit, no father figure. As Joshua's father, we really don't know if he was if he was really a believer or if he died at an early age. And so he, he got counsel from Moses. And Jesus, we know that his father was not there in the latter years of, of his life either. And and so when we see when we see obedience, you begin to see a trend of of those who really cling to to God and to a level of obedience that that is quite uncanny. But in the in two ten of Esther, Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. So here he was, her uncle, a stand-in father, ensuring her safety, doing all that he could to protect her. And listen, you cannot say anything because your life would be in great jeopardy. Obedience is key. If she would have blabbed and gotten on Twitter, oh, um, da 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 like the dumb criminals, you know, they're, they're so smart that they take a picture of themselves. Here's the bank we just robbed on Twitter. Ooh, aren't we so smart? And then they get caught. How did we get caught? I just don't, I don't know. <laughs> the dumb criminals. But, but if Esther would not have gotten the clue and would not have walked in obedience to that, the people would never have been free. Your obedience may be the key to freeing people in future generations. Your obedience may be key to freeing your own family. Your obedience is key for your future and your present. It's not really a word that we like to discuss because we like to go and do as we like to go and do and be our own gods and know of all things, except, except, and I still say this, that my amount of wisdom is still the size of a pinprick. What I don't know is so much greater. So why would I ever want to rely on my own ways. I did that. My life was a mess. Why would I ever go back and think that I'm so smart? It was terrible. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. Esther understood protocol. She understood authority. She submitted to it, even so much so that when she became queen, in his historical documents demonstrate that, that she was really at the mercy of the king and that he was known to rape her. He was the king. He was the king. Period. Didn't quite much matter anything else. He was the king. He got what he wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted, regardless of what she was in being a human. Nowhere is the word God mentioned in the book of Esther, but yet her obedience freed 127 provinces of Jewish people, or Hebrews. We begin to see that Mordecai, Mordecai provided a way for her. Throughout all of these things, her obedience reigned supreme. What a fine line for her to have to walk in this positioning of knowing what she knows or knew about her own background, about her own family and her own lineage, and not be able to speak of it. You know, we deal with that in this ministry with many that come to Jesus Christ in many Muslim nations. And those of you I know are listening in parts of India, you're listening in, in parts of China, I know that you're listening in parts of, of Africa, my brother, my pastor in, the, in Malawi and, and in other places in Uzbekistan and Syria and Libya and all these places that we don't really talk about. But I know that, that when and Lahore, Pakistan, so on and so forth, that when many Muslims and Imams too that come to Christ, out of obedience for their lives, they come to Christ, they're followers of Yeshua, 
but for their very lives and for the lives of their families and their villages, they know how to operate. We often expect that there would be an outpour of, of something, but yet obedience in, is, is their protection of their very life and their livelihood. Esther had to walk through all of this in addition to what she was married to in order to do what God needed done through her. Obedience is not easy. Let's not sugarcoat it. It is not easy. It is putting the grocery cart back in the rain when no one is watching, but God is. It is when you are overcharged, letting the clerk know you're being overcharged. It is out of love that you recognize that God is there. It is not walking in a level of deceit that because nobody saw, that means that you get away with it. No, God saw. In all things, God sees. We don't need to have big brother, we have God. I don't know why, I mean, we really just need a big God, call it a day, right? I mean, these people think that they're so ingenious. Oh, they're watching. Why are we so concerned with big brother watching and not concerned with God watching? Esther stood, Job stood. Turn with me to Joshua, the general. I really like Joshua. I'm doing an in-depth study on Joshua. And I'm learning so much about Joshua. And I just like Joshua. I just think he's cool. I just, he's just, just to really see an imagery of his life and what he went through growing up with, with family lineage that were all e slaves in Egypt and, and to really see what, fa what his family went through and how that would mold someone. And maybe, maybe you've seen something similar to this in your, in your own family bloodline. But, but when we start in chapter 1 of Joshua, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant is, servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Now, he continues on, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Notice the key word, all. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Interesting that it was at the end that prosperity for Joshua came. A lot of times people expect to do nothing, sit, and then get blessed with more than anything and walk it out. But you see, there's a testing time. There's a testing to see how obedient you will be. Noah demonstrated his obedience. Lot was first obedient, then blessed. Prophet Micaiah, uh, he stood obedient. Job was blessed and he stood obedient and God blessed him with more. Esther walked through it, and then mightily people were blessed. Joshua walked through under, as an under, as a study under Moses. He, he studied Moses. What, what a great opportunity to learn. I mean, just imagine, <clears throat> imagine <clears throat> what I learned from Moses to be in that position. Anger doesn't pay. <laughs> but... But to be in such a position, if only we had generals today that would be like that of Joshua. I mean, where did our generals go? Joshua was obedient. And when he's given the command, be obedient to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. When we are obedient to all of what we've been given, then we will be prosperous and successful. But the catch is that we toss it out, 
the baby with the bathwater, that came from Moses, tossed him out, baby in the bathwater. And then we expect everything. But can God trust you? If God cannot trust you with the little things, then why would he give you more to only continue to prove you're unworthy and untrustworthy and disobedient? We often forget that it's a relationship. We just walk, well, I'm this, gimme. But obedience is the demonstration of your love that demonstrates your worthiness that God can trust you and bless you with these things, knowing what they will be put to use for. In all of these people, they demonstrated obedience on the earth, and we still look at them today. We can look back and see others who failed miserably, who, who became great leaders in their times, whether it was Washington or Churchill. We can see the outcome. We can see David in all things. Yes, he was quick to be obe obedient. He, he messed up a lot. But when you stand, you're going to have to make a choice to stand alone. The final person that I would be remiss to not share today is Jesus. Jesus stood alone in the midst of hatred. He stood alone. We might say alone, but we know that the Father was with him. But he was considered, we might say, an outcast in many ways. Jesus already told us that if they hated me, they'll hate you too. So it should be no surprise if you're mocked or ridiculed for being a follower of, of, of Christ. Wear it like a badge of honor, because why on earth would you care what the under-average God-haters think of you? Their opinion of you is not your business. Your obedience to God is really your only business. It's going to cost you something. It will cost you flesh. But as you overcome your flesh to walk by your spirit, you will be fine with whatever the sacrifice is, because your obedience to Christ will be what carries you through. Your obedience to Christ above all will help you to overcome as Christ overcame so that we could all be here and be free. Obedience to Christ is something that in these common times, you're not going to be seeing a lot of it. And those that you do see that are obedient to Christ, you'll know about them because we're seeing the mockery, the diminishment of all things of those who follow Christ. Don't expect to think that it's going to go away. The removal of God the Father is moving at a rampant pace. Wherever you are, whatever continent you are on or in, it is up to you to stand. Are you going to stand flip-floppy? Are you going to waver? Are you going to surrender? Are you going to compromise like many we can, we can see before us that have compromised? that they've chosen to mix their religion with other false religions and think it's good? Or are you going to stand and say, this is the word of God? The word of God is, I don't want you to go to hell speech or word. The word of God is not hate speech. It is, I love you speech and want you to live. The word of God is the word that will save you. The word of God that is, is the word that will demonstrate to you your full identity, whether man or woman boy or girl. The Word of God is what will separate the chaos and the disorder from the order. The Word of God in standing in full obedience will move you to places where you will be like the greats, like the great Queen Esther, like Lot, like Noah, like the prophet Micaiah or Job or Joshua. But you will have to make that stand because nobody else can stand for you. Nobody else can be obedient for you. This is your walk with Jesus, and you have to be the one that will say, above all, I'm going to stand. And as you do so, you will recognize that you really aren't alone. You're in company of those great men and women who have come before you, and you are setting that standard for your generation now and in the generations to come. And so I pray today that you earnestly investigate where you are and that those doors that have been open to compromise or to any form of sin or to any form of rebellion, that, that you really ask the Holy Spirit to do a new work in you 
so that you are ready and strong enough and capable enough to stand and to stay standing. So that today, saints, is my message. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for making the way for us. We thank you for obedience above all. We thank you that your hand is upon us. And we give you the praise and the glory, Father, that every door will be exposed so we can shut it. That we are standing. We thank you for the greats. We thank you for Lot. We thank you for Noah. We thank you for Job. We thank you for Esther. We thank you for Micaiah. We thank you for Joshua, for King David. We thank you, Father, for Shagmar, who too killed 600 Philistines. And we thank you, Father, for Jesus, who set the standard for us all. We give you the praise and the glory for making the way for us today to say today is the day I am obedient. Tomorrow is the day I will remain so and I will stand for all the days that you have ordained me to live and to breathe. And I thank you that through that my all is for you. So, Father, we thank you for making the way. We thank you for those who have, who, have, who have gone before us to demonstrate to us what it takes to stand and that we are willing to do exactly that. So we praise you, Father. We thank you for these things and we pray them all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And to God be the glory. Today is a great day. Every day we pray at 12 o'clock. That is every day for about the last five years now, almost about five and a half. Every day at 12 o'clock, 214-586-0411. And you can go to julieblair.com and you'll find the daily prayer and all the country codes. We're working on adding about 30 more countries. So whatever country you hail from, we just invite you to join us in prayer every day. The goal is every continent to be represented and pray together. So there's a lot more at julieblow.com, Kingdom Mentorship Messages on Thursday nights. I invite you to join us. There's a lot that we are moving to and in and in this season to really prepare for what is to come. You need to be prepared in and out of season. Make sure you have your food stocks, supplies. Make sure that your home is in order and that you just know Jesus. So God bless you today in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. It is a great day. God bless you. And I'll be back with the next message in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know what? Hold on a minute. God is saying we cannot do, we cannot do this without saying one more thing. I thought I was finished, but you know what? If you don't know Jesus, you need to know Jesus. I cannot leave without not telling you about Jesus, the one who changed and saved my life. You need to know him. How do you know him? All you need to do is say, Jesus, I made a mess of my life and I need you to be my savior. You can use your own words. I'm not into templates and just talk to him. You need to know him. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, what you made of your life. You just stop what you're doing and just say, Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. And I can't get through what's coming without you. Will you be the center of my life? And as you do that, I know that he will be. And if you happen to need a Bible, you just go to julieblow.com and we'll make sure you get a Bible. And if you need help getting into a Bible, a full gospel Bible-based church, we can, we can assist with finding some in your local area. And of course, we do, we do trainings and we're here every week and we pray daily. But you need to know Jesus, and I thank, I thank you, Lord, that I did not leave by not sharing Jesus with you. You need to know him. If you received him as your Lord and Savior, hey, just hit, the, just hit our subscribe but partner button. I wish I could change that and let us know you did that. But just share that you come to know Jesus so we can celebrate and keep you lifted up in prayer. We pray for you all daily in our daily prayer and with my prayer team. So know you're prayed for. But if you if you, you just came to know Jesus, let me know because I want to just get up and rejoice with you. So now we can close out today. God bless you and I'll be back whenever the next message is that he has for us. Love you all. Bye. Be faithful. Bye-bye.